Right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Headlands tasting. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome. Right, if you'd uh, like Dave. to keep yourselves all on on mute uh, uh, while we head into the uh, uh, the nitty gritty, um, it would be great if you can put your cameras on. Otherwise, it gets a little voyeuristic uh, <laughs> looking at just names. Uh, so we'd like to uh, like to see all your faces and uh, your facial expressions while you're drinking the uh, the whiskies. Hopefully, you've all got some water nearby, and uh, uh, you've got your your pack of. Uh, well, four whiskeys and one one gin, and uh, hopefully you aren't driving because if you do finish everything in front of you, you will be over the limit. That's uh, our RSA disclaimer out of the way. What you do from here on is up to you. I just let uh, everybody else in. But without uh, further ado. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jared, uh, broadcasting live from the Headlands Distillery in Wollongong. And uh, he's uh, uh, one of the, the dream team that uh, has been quietly working away, making fantastic whiskeys down in Wollongong, flying under the radar for quite a number of years. And uh, now it's uh, uh, basically uh, where a lot of uh, Australian distilleries make a big fanfare of uh, of what's coming and before they even start construction of the distillery, uh, these guys have just been uh, making some uh, uh, gins, liqueurs and, and whiskies. And then all of a sudden, boom, we've got uh, a couple of uh, five-year-old whiskies to market. So welcome, Jared. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so the, the whiskey age really happened by accident. So we were planning to release our whiskies as two-year-old whiskies in 2018. Uh, but we were quite naive um, back then, <laughs> not knowing what we were getting into, especially doing the full size casks, um, 200 litre casks. The kind of idea was since it's a lot warmer in Wollongong than it is in Tasmania, then the aging would be accelerated. And we're also doing um, a few tricky things with the ferment to make quite a clean spirit, a cold fermentation. Um, so we're hoping to release the whiskies in 2018 as two year old. When we went to taste them, they were definitely not ready. So um, the 200-litre the 200 full-size casks in Wollongong definitely need longer than two years. So the next year, um, we had planned to release them as well, 2019, but then we got caught up with gin. We were doing a lot of different gin um, releases, uh, and it, we, we only have um, basically Dean and myself for the staff, the workers, that so we don't have um, a team here. So. It's a, it takes more effort than you think to organize the bottles, the labels, the wax dipping, all that kind of thing. So we, we didn't make it in, term, in time for that Christmas. And then um, the first release happened a year later in 2020, which ended up being four years. And the whiskey definitely benefited from the extra two years. Fantastic. Well, we've got, uh, you've got your core range, which is your Apera and your Muscat casks. Um, I think let's just leap right in with the, the first one being the Apera cask, and mm. uh, um, uh, they're at 46%, at, uh, and uh, while the guys are pouring their, their samples, uh, I could just uh, introduce that uh, uh, for our, our audience, and um, what's the, the, the cask maturation regime, so they're all, all full-size casks, is that uh, 46%? So, um, I'd say everyone here knows um, Apera, since they're whiskey tasters, but if you don't know, it's basically... Um, Spanish sherry, but Australian made. So um, it's uh, short for aperitif, which is, you know, a sweet pre-dinner drink, uh, dessert style wine, or a pre or post-dinner dessert style wine. The one that we use um, to season the barrels with is from Seppertsfield, and it's the Rare Rich Apera, which is an exact copy of Oloroso sherry. Um, it's an 18-year-old, um, which is actually South Australian grapes. Um, the musket cask, which we'll talk about later, is the grapes are grown in Rutherglen and then transported to Seppertsfield. But this Apera cask is grown, um, the grapes are grown in South Australia. Um, so we send off that we buy the one. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of a, a, a little bit of a long winded story. But basically, we, we picked the musket and the Apera from Seppertsfield. We thought they were absolutely delicious fortified wines. And then basically, we wanted those casks at whatever cost. 
So we contacted Seppertsfield and they said, no, sorry, we can't give you those casks. But we were set in our ways. No, we want to release a whiskey with the 18-year-old Oloroso, a para cask, and the 15-year-old rare musket. So um, we ended up buying the wine from them, bulk um, wholesale wine, and then sending it to Master Cask Cooperage in South Australia, and they season the barrels for us. So um, they'll rotate the wine through the barrel seasoning for, for many months. And then when the wine is used up for its seasoning process, it gets sent back to us. And um, a few of the local bars around Wollongong are using the spent seasoning wine um, in their cocktails. So the Apera is a lighter and drier style um, than the musket, which we'll taste um, later. Um, and that comes through in the whiskey. You're gonna get some fruit peel, light notes, but not overly sweet, uh, a light and more session sessionable whiskey. So is this, is this fully matured in the Apera or is it finished? No. So um, all our styles, basically at the moment, because we didn't really know what we were getting into um, back in 2016, we've started them all off in ex-bourbon casks. And then they have about a year in the, in the finishing fortified wine cask. So you're going to get some notes from the bourbon class, like the vanilla, butterscotch, um, the, the apple and citrus flavors come from the new make spirit, but um, some of also the citrus will come from the finishing cask. Uh, so yeah, the, the toffee, the toffee, vanilla, bourbon cask notes will be there, um, plus some extra from the fortified cask. You could just talk us through now that you, you've mentioned some of the, some of the, the notes that you're going to get. Uh, the, the bottling strength at 46, um, was that decided up front or is that what it ended up being? Uh, so we wanted to release it a little bit stronger so that um, someone who prefers more flavor can have it. But if you do want to um, drink it at 40%, then be more than welcome to add a few drops of water to bring the, um, the ABV down and, and open it up even more. But uh, some people um, like a bit of heat, me included. <laughs> There's a little bit more spice in the Apera. Um, and yeah, it's it's... It's a quite a pleasant spice on the finish, still quite smooth at 46. So we thought, why dilute it anymore if it's, if it's already drinkable at 46? Well, it's certainly got that, that buttery mouthfeel to it, which is, mm. which is fantastic. I don't think it needs any water. Um, guys, feel free. If you've got any comments or questions, pop them in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll pass them on, on to Jared. Um, the, um, in terms of your, uh, uh, your, your new make, it's... Uh, um, is, is you do everything in, in house your, yeah, uh, we mill the grain, ferment, distill, etc. Um, and we've got a very good connection with a farmer. So, um, a lot of the grain comes from him, not all, but a lot of the grain that we use comes direct from the farm in, in Tamora and he'll organize um, that for us, which is really cool. Cause we can actually control the variety of grain that he plants. If you're buying grain from instance, Bintani, um, or other um, places, you can't actually choose the strain. Um, grain Corp might send them a, a mixed lot of grain. Sometimes they won't. Their signature malt is a single variety, but some of the other ones, um, there might be a, a blend of many different um, grain strains in there. And grains are as variant as breeds of dog. There's, there's hundreds of them. Um, and the one that our farmer grows is Latrobe, uh, three sorry latrobe planet and commander and we use the latrobe one and also interesting uh there's a lot of uh, chatter uh online about uh 500 mil versus 700 mil bottles in in australian whiskies you've gone the 700 mil route which uh um and and w was there a decision process made on that of course um we want to be competitive on an international stage in terms of value for uh, when we compare it to a Scotch whiskey. So uh, we don't want to just write off the uh, Sullivan's Cove, excellent whiskey, but we don't have the, the medals that they do. We haven't won a world's best whiskey award. So we, um, as a fledgling company, don't kind of want to be writing off the back of their success. We want to forge out our own path. Um, and initially, we definitely want to provide um, value compared to like a Glen Dronach um, or, or a younger Glen Goyne in terms of the sherry cask range. Excellent. So it's any, not uh, the same comparing a Glen Goyne 18 <laughs> to our six, but um, it's, it's closer than some of the others. <laughs> so guys, if you've uh, your first time trying the uh, um, 
the Headlands Apera. Uh, any thoughts? Initial initial thoughts off the top of the top of the bat. Can I just say, I can really smell uh, smoke on the nose. Ah, uh, yeah. There's a hint of peat in in both of them, in the musket and the Apera. I was wondering and... where that came from. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I was wondering where it came from because you didn't mention it. It's yeah, it's really really gentle. It's, it's a very tiny amount of, of peat, but um, just yeah. really nice, subtle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, we were tossing up whether to add it on the tasting notes, um, and we kind of just blended that in with the with the smoky oak flavors. Uh, since the barrels are heavily charred, you'll get a little bit from that, but um, there is a a very tiny amount of peat in 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 all three whiskies, but none, there's none in the French oak that we'll taste later on. So you'll taste quite a different flavor in that French oak cask. Now, just to, curious about the the journey and everybody's always intrigued as to when uh, new Australian distilleries pop up as to what drew you all to making whiskey. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, uh, you guys can read on the Headlands website, um, you've got uh, a mix of uh, um, Jared as a chemical engineer, uh, Dean's got his MBA, uh, you've got a few scientists in there, a few PhDs uh, involved as well. Um, how did you all come together to make whiskey? Uh, yeah, so Dean's actually more of a whiskey lover. I, I love whiskey as well, but um, Dean, he's having a bit of a giggle. I started off um, being obsessed with making vodka. Um, so vodka is something that needs to be ready immediately. So from a chemical engineering perspective, it's actually much more difficult to make vodka. It has to be drinkable the next day. There's no waiting four years for the barrel and the, the nature to take over. Um, but whiskey has actually grown on me throughout the years and now I much prefer it to vodka. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Dean's to thank for, um, the initial push in the whiskey direction, um, while I was more focusing on making the purest vodka that we can. And a lot of the techniques are applicable. If you, um, with vodka, you need to be on top of every single variable. As I said, it needs to be drinkable tomorrow. It's, you can't wait for the, um, the angel share, the methanol, the ethyl acetate to evaporate off after six years. And when you have control over every single little process, um, then when you, do go to do the whiskey, um, you're definitely not going to make it um, pure like a vodka, but you have control over the variables. And that's something that is um, really cool to us, to, to, to our distillery. So the, uh, this Apera is, um, say, batch two. Um, so they, they single batch, but not single cask releases? They're, they're not single cask, no. So we have, um, from that batch, there was three different casks blended together. Um, one had more spice, um, one had less spice and was smoother. Um, so I wanted a little bit of spice on the finish, um, but also um, the smoothness in the mid palate. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's an internal blend of three different casks. Great. And the muscat, let's, uh, as we can leap into the, the muscat now. Um, those of you aren't familiar with them, the, 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 the packaging and the labeling is, is quite cool as well. It's got uh, a lot of detail on the labels, a bit of em embossing, uh, differentiating the one from the other. Yeah, so um, muscat's a rich, almost black fortified wine. Mo most of you guys have probably tasted it. So Seppert's Field don't actually release the rare muscat. So if it's called Grand, in a fortified wine, it means at least 10 years. And if it, and if it says rare, then it means eight, uh, 15 plus. So the musket that we use is a rare musket, which is a 15 year old wine. And that's um, gone through the same process. So we buy the bulk wine from Seppertsfield. We send it to master cask for barrel seasoning. And then um, we use those barrels to age. And um, quite annoyingly, after we had just done the first release of the musket cask, um, Master Cask emailed me and said, hey, we've got all these 40-year-old authentic Seppertsfield barrels. Do you want some? I said, oh, we just spent a year making seasoned casks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the musket is much sweeter, the actual wine itself, when you compare the musket versus the Oloroso-style sherry. It comes through in the whiskey um, being smoother and a longer finish but less spice. 
you'll get more rich sultana and fruity notes and a, a little bit of a, I get a little bit of cocoa, um, but that's that cocoa flavor is starting to develop um, in, in subsequent batches. It was less in the first batch and the cocoa is starting to come through in the batch too. It's, it's, it's certainly there. It's um, the, the longer it sits in the glass and, and just on that, on that finish, there's definitely that, that dry cocoa. Mm. So any, any, those of you who've tried the Apera versus the Muscat, obviously it's hard to find a, a favorite child, but uh, uh, anybody out there who's, who's got any preference between the two? They both retail at the same price. Um, Apera is winning. <laughs> <laughs> it's much smoother. You, you prefer a lighter, drier style? Well, between these two, yeah, um, that was a bit of a smack of the face, the Muscat. I wasn't quite expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite loud. Yeah, it's good. Uh, tannic, a little bit. Mm. Hey, David, are you trying the um, musket cask now? Yes. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yep. Thanks. Yep. So we're on the musket. Yep. Jared, the one, the one interesting uh, uh, snippet which uh, uh, you mentioned at the distillery was uh, the the whole uh, one of the kind of uh, uh, focuses or, or um, aims in terms of uh, energy efficiency or energy efficient usage. Mm. Uh, can you just, sure. uh, just fill that in? Because it's, uh, um, uh, I think it's uh, obviously with all the engineering backgrounds in, uh, uh, in the team, um, uh, but was that a, a, something that you decided on right from the beginning that it was a, a route that you were going to go? Uh, yeah, so um, the first all those first four years of whiskies were made with 100% renewable energy and also recycling a lot of the waste heat. So um, basically, since we're using renewable power, we have to cut down a lot of our energy usage. So um, it makes sense from a sustainability aspect, but also from a, just a straight up price. So um, we don't want to be throwing money down the drain when um, there is processes out there. Um, for instance, um, fuel plants have they're not going to waste a single kilowatt um and but whiskey distilleries especially craft distilleries are terribly inefficient so we're applying a lot of the large-scale industrial fuel plant techniques into our craft distillery on a very small scale but it's saving our power bills by about 80 percent by reusing the waste heat basically every time we generate some heat we exchange that with some other um stream that where that either the fermentation or we use the input product to condense the next batch um, and we, we get that heat back. Did you have to change the processes uh, at all to, uh, to ensure that you had that maximum uh, yeah, so saving? The processes are quite different. So the initial stripping run is done on, it's kind of a column, but it's fed into a top plate. So it's only one distillation, but that means that um, this one plate column um, we can actually pump the, the fermentation wash as the, as the distillation coolant. So the, the condenser is run by the actual fermentation, the wash, the 8% the alcohol. Um, and then that runs through the condenser, condenses itself, condenses the alcohol product, and then it's pumped into the still already at 60 degrees for free. So um, basically, instead of wasting a lot of water as well, we have a 5,000 liter tank of the of the 8% alcohol, that is our coolant liquid. So that's at say 20 degrees, that pumps through the condenser, gets preheated to 60 degrees and then injected injected in, already hot. No, fantastic, that's, <laughs> uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, interesting that uh, um, I'm, I know obviously a guy like Peter Bignall has also gone the renewables route, but uh, um, can't think of uh, in, any others that have uh, gone to, to that extent uh, There's a few continuous columns being installed at the moment. For instance, I think uh, Lark might be installing a, a continuous column. And I think Adelaide Hills might be doing one as well. But um, there, people are starting to get on top of the energy efficiency. But it is quite a large capital expense to not just use um, a classic steel. Um, and it is much more difficult to control. So um, it's not just a pot with on off. 
it's um it's got sensors everywhere and the sensors are expensive um all different things can go wrong so uh it's not as simple as um and boiling a pot and collecting the vapor basically did you design the still yourself or did you just get an off-the-shelf one that was available i uh, know it's um it's made by me but i definitely had help so um uh, a company called Coke Glitch, a German company, helped um, with, with the design of our of our larger one. But yeah, it's a bit of a joint project. The, the, the initial design was done by me, but the finished product is is co-built by them. Excellent. Well, um, to complete the core range, we thought we'd throw in uh, one of the, the title lines. I, I just love mm. the bottles um, <laughs> of your, your Illawarra, Illawarra Plum um uh gin uh and and uh, also the uh, the whole illawarra, illawarra plum story is quite cool as well um can you just explain uh, those of you who aren't familiar with illawarra plums um mm. where do they grow how are they uh, are they farmed are they sold are they used for anything else yeah, so there's quite a few native plums in Australia, and none of them are actually plums. They're all their own separate bush tucker species. It's just when the settlers first came, it was the closest thing they could liken it to. So they gave it like the name Davidson plum, Illawarra plum, Kakadu plum, Burdekin plum, for instance. We have um, in North New South Wales, Southern Queensland, there's a fruit that's getting quite popular called the Davidson plum, which is quite sour. Um, Brookies are using that in their slow gin. Um, down our way in Wollongong, an hour south of Sydney, we have our own native plum, which is called the Illawarra plum. Uh, the, the, um, the local people, indigenous people call it Dalgal. Uh, it's, a small, it's a small native berry, uh, about the size of a, la a very large olive, and it has an external seed on it, um, which is really weird. So the seeds on the outside of the fruit, uh, we snap that seed off. Um, and then we start the fruit to stew, like a, a very short wild fermentation. And then we put it into barrels and um, basically fortify it. So we're kind of making a fortified wine um, from the Illawarra plum fruit. Um, so, but this one is a gin steeped in the Illawarra plum fruit. So the question is, why? Um, obviously, it's native there, but yeah. And 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 do they do they grow wild? Can you just walk through? Yeah. Walk so along current, the, the... currently, nobody's farming the Illawarra plum at all. So we have to wild forage or rely on people who um, have them on their on their on their property, just growing wild up the up the back of their farm. Um, we'll knock on their door. We know where they are because there was a <laughs> there was an ancient study done like in 1940 by the university, and they've mapped a lot of the populations. So we'll knock on the farmer's door and we'll say, hey, can um, you have Illawarra plums? Can we pick them? And some of them will say, no, get lost. And we'll say, we'll trade alcohol. And then they're our best friend. I'll just pop in um, real so, quick and say that it's, um, it, it's always really fun at the distillery when we, when we have people come in to do taste because generally, you know, it, it might be the, the male and the you know, the, the guy and the girl that come in, the guy, or the, the girl is normally the gin drinker and she says, oh, babe, you've, you've got to try this. And he's like, no, nah, I only drink whiskey and beer. And I'm like, guys, I've played this game before. Give it a try, have it, have a go. The Aura Plum is, um, it's actually a gin that, you know, nine whiskey drinkers out of 10 uh, sort of, you know, quite enjoy to drink that one. So that's why we thought that it'd be really exciting to, um, to, add, to add to this tasting. A couple of questions on that. Uh, firstly, no, it's really sweet. Now, Michael reckons it's, it's delicious. And um, uh, but is is it in terms of sugar? It's, it comes across as really sweet. Yeah, there's and, a little um, bit of sugar added. So the Illawarra plum has got a lot of tannin from the plum skin. So um, we do offer an Illawarra plum product called Spirit of the Illawarra plum, which is completely unsweetened. It's the raw Illawarra plum product, but um, you have to strap in for that one because the tannins can be really overpowering. It's very mouth drying. So a, a tiny bit of sugar really rounds out the mouth feel of that product. Um, sim the same thing is with the Davidson plum. It's basically never served without a hint of sugar uh, due to the Davidson plum being super sour. So the Illawarra plum isn't sour, but it has a really high uh, tannin and antioxidant content in the skin. So, um, it's much more pleasant with it, with a little bit of sweetness. 
And what in terms of, of volume, what, what kind of yield do you get? How many, how many kilos of plums do so you the, need for the The max batch? we've got per year is 500 kilos, and that's about the entire of the world supply. So for, um, for us to go any bigger with that gin, we're actually planting our own trees. So Dean and his, his, his mum and dad and his grandma and at my house, everyone has Illawarra plums lining the sides of their houses, um, much to the annoyance of our parents. But uh, we in three years time, it's the hope that we'll be able to get a small block of land to plant them, plant them out in. Um, basically, we need to create the supply if we're to take it any bigger. Yeah, it's uh, you know, between the sustainability of the uh, uh, distillery and also your natural resources, it's uh, you know, kind of uh, keeping everything in, in, in a closed loop. Um, a question yeah. about the, uh, Ivan asked about your juniper. Where do you get your juniper berries from? So uh, the juniper in the tidal lines and the mountain sea, the classic gin um, is actually European juniper, but we have a separate product, which is called Bubiala gin which is made with 100% native Australian juniper, which is a, a coastal plant, which is a different species. Um, I'll just quickly grab a bottle and show you that one sec. So um, if you see this one on our website, it'll be releasing in a couple of weeks. Um, that's made with a, an Australian native species. So, whether this is gin or not is pushing the boundaries, but uh, we decided to call it gin, um, basically so it would have a, a category with that's similar to something that already exists. Um, so botanists call this fruit Bubiella Australian native juniper, but it's actually a completely separate species from the Macedonian European juniper. Uh, so it has a juniper-like flavor. It's got a little bit of like a pine, a little bit of camphor, but it's much less intense than the, the strong pine juniper, you know, camphor flavor, turpentine-like of the, of the um, Macedonian European juniper. Now you've, uh, with both that one and the, uh, the tidal lines, you've kind of got this, uh, the, the kind of uh, looks like out of a chemistry lab bottle, um, <laughs> which uh, it, 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 uh, packaging them and, and, and sending them could be a challenge. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, it's, also a, it's also a challenge for bars because it doesn't fit in their pouring rack, which means <laughs> they have to put it on the top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in the, um, I was a, a, I did chemistry at uni and was a chemical engineer previously. So, in the chem lab, there's a bottle that looks like this and it's called a volumetric flask. Um, and it's going to be hard to see, but in there, you might be able to see there's a line scratched in the neck. And um, the, the company who creates these bottles will make sure that that line is scratched at exactly, for instance, 700 mils, whatever the marking is on the bottle. They'll, they'll fill it up with a, an amount of um, distilled water. So it's not got any impurities in it. They'll weigh it. With a, with a really accurate scale and then they'll scratch that line in. So that bottle will be very, very accurately 700 mils. Um, and why the neck is thin, it's so when you're making up a solution like a, a chemical mixture, um, one drop will move up and down more because the neck's thin. Because this doesn't have as, the neck doesn't have as much volume in it, um, the one drop will move up more so you can get it very accurately to 700 mils. Um, so basically the gin bottles are a copy of that volumetric flask, but they've been changed in shape a little bit to make them more manufacturable from a, a blow molding perspective. So uh, yeah, that's the story behind the, the gin bottle. <laughs> well, I have to say that uh, once, once the gin is finished, they make fantastic water bottles. Yeah, or even flowers. vases for flowers. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, definitely nothing will go to waste. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have been putting uh, fairy lights in them or using them for a vase and that kind of thing. So, yeah. We also recycle them if you bring them back. We sterilize them and reuse them for bars and restaurants. They don't care if they're a bit scratched up. Right. Well, that's the, the, the core range, the Apera, Muscat, uh, uh, whiskies, the... Uh, uh, Illawarra Plum Tidal Lines Gin. Um, so let's just take a, a leap into the future with the uh, the next one, which is the, the French Oak, the work in progress. Yeah, so uh, quite a quite a different um, 
project this one. So instead of using X bourbon cask, this one is in, um, so there's a very fancy cooperage in, um, in, in Europe called Sylvain. The barrels are very expensive. Uh, we could never afford one directly. <laughs> so we, um, got a, we got a few Sylvain barrels from a winery and um, I knocked them apart and shaved them back the insides and then toasted them ourselves. Um, so it's a fresh, untoasted, not charred Sylvain barrel, um, which is, yeah, a very prestigious cooperage um, in Europe. And uh, it's made with a different style of malt, um, which is called Vienna malt. It's a, it's a slightly roasted malt profile. Um, you're going to get a lot of different flavors out of this. It's, it's um, I think I bottled this at 40 something, 42%. 42, yes. Um, yeah, quite, quite different than the, a different spirit and a different um, barrel than uh, the musket or the apera. So this is in a 200 liter barrel. So um, you've still got some cleaning up to go for sure, as you can probably taste. So this is, this has been that, that whole time in this French Yeah, so that yeah. was never in a bourbon cask. That went straight into a fresh, fresh um, French oak. So it was fresh, but it was reshaved rather than being a brand new barrel. And, and the plans for this? Just uh, wait a bit longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, so obviously the whole idea is to uh, to give some feedback uh, to the the Headlands team on what you guys think of this and uh, as as a work in progress. Yeah, let me know um, what tasting notes you're picking up. Feedback on the on the French oak cask, um, whether you like it or whether you or you don't. I'm open to <laughs> constructive criticism is always good. Certainly, it's 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 quite a dry finish. Um, that I've, it's I've really intensely oaky. You can taste yeah. the fresh oak. So, um, bourbon cask. A lot of the oak has already gone into the bourbon. You know, like probably I don't know the percent, eighty percent of it, maybe more. Um, so, by shaving back the cask and and not charring it, just having it toasted, the flavor is very very oaky, fresh oak flavor, rather than. Uh, being more spirit forward. So this has got a lot of fresh oak. We definitely picked up on that. A lot of uh, vanilla and oak on the nose straight up. Mm. And the malt comes in underneath, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the French oak will be a bit spicier than the, uh, the bourbon. But uh, yeah, it's quite intensely oaky. Maybe too oaky. So <laughs> you guys, don't, do you think this is too oaky or it's... No? You, you like a bit of fresh oak? No such thing. No such thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, it's, uh, the, the comments have been all, all very positive. Nutty flavors. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, and, and as, as uh, Zach uh, points out, it's, uh, it's, it is all about the cask. Mm. Can I ask, if you leave it in that same barrel, will it soften? Will it lose a bit of the oaky flavor or will it continue to build on it? So uh, it's been in there about two years now. So I wouldn't imagine too much more oak. It will still get some more, um, but the oak, it will start to uh, taper off in terms of how much oak it adds per year. So if I leave it in another three years, it'll still add some more, but it's going to be not like double. It's going to be an extra 10%. Um, and uh, what was the other question about some of the other flavors? Yeah, I'm not quite sure how they're, we have to wait and see. So you, you had um, you, one cask or several casks that, you, that you've- done? There's just one of that, but there's another one that it's its brother, which is the same thing, but charred. So um, this, is a, this one's a bit of an experiment to see if we want to do more. So there's the there's the yeah there's the exact same thing that was heavily charred on the inside. Uh, we'll definitely uh, uh, keep everybody informed as to the progress because uh, uh, I think that a lot of people will be quite interested to see how this progresses when it's uh, ready for bottling. Mm. 
Right. Uh, um, so just just a, just uh, one thing I forgot to to ask about the about the gin is um, uh, it's it's certainly it's drinkable on its own. But what uh, uh, how would how would you guys recommend that uh, that the Illawarra plum gin is is uh, is actually drunk? Uh, yeah. So because that gin is slightly sweet, it pairs really well in cocktails that have a sour component from lemon juice or other citrus or sour components. So um, there's a cocktail, basically like if you're going to make a whiskey sour, you just substitute the whiskey with gin and a gin sour. It's the gin, lemon juice, and then either egg white or aquafaba, which is the liquid in a can of chickpeas. It's quite a strong cocktail. It's just basically straight gin with lemon juice um, and, and the, the egg white or the aquafaba to froth it to make the foam on the top and you just shake it and serve. Uh, so that's a really nice way to enjoy that. It's it's alcohol heavy and um, the lemon juice just balances out the sweet. It doesn't take away from the flavors. Yep, going to have to try that one. Um, yeah, the, Paul reckons the French oak starts off a little flat, develops with an explosion of flavors. So it's, I think even at 42, just letting it sit in the glass a bit uh, uh, certainly will change those flavors. There's no, no doubt. Mm. Uh, before we get on to the uh, uh, the whiskey lists bourbon cask, um, when uh, when you're not drinking Headlands whiskey, um, what are you drinking? And uh, uh, I asked, asked <laughs> we, Dean the same question. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, right now, um, this is this is top secret for only this, <laughs> this chat room, but um, I'm currently really obsessed with sake and shochu. Um, Japanese koji mold products. So um, we're doing some experiments with um, inoculating um, our barley with koji and making that into a whiskey. So um, Dean and I went out for dinner with a bunch of our other friends last night and we had some um, Dasai 23 sake, which is um, sake is basically characterized in how much rice is left when they've done the polishing process. So <laughs> this distillery has taken a full rice grain and they've removed 73, 70, 77% of the rice they removed. They just left the, the tiny center of the piece of rice. Then they inoculated that with koji mold and then they've um, fermented that. So yeah, I've been drinking a, a bit of sake lately, but we drink, we love, I love drinking the musket cask. Um, Dean loves drinking all the casks. So we're basically drinking all our own stuff all the time. <laughs> we don't need to buy when there's so much good stuff on around the place. Well, it's all research and so every sip is a tax deduction. For sure. Uh, we love Japanese whiskey, actually. Um, both Dean and I have a, a good collection of Japanese whiskeys, the Yamazaki, um, Hakushu, for instance, others. Um, one of the ones I... Oh, I'll just say yeah, Jared's been yeah. on mute. Um, I I got Jared uh, for his for his birthday. I got him uh, the Balvini, the um, the fourteen. It was in um, in the ex rum casks, uh, the Caribbean Caribbean rum. Um, yeah, we thought that one was uh, yeah that one was really quite delicious. It wasn't wasn't super expensive. From memory, it was about one hundred and fifty bucks, and um, I thought that was that was pretty reasonable. Um, and then um, there's an Ockentoshan one. Um, that's a it's, a it's a scotch um obviously from scotland that um that tom who's one of the other founders uh, he went over to over to scotland for a conference and when he came back he he brought back a bunch of the ockentoshan ones and yeah we we thought they were delicious so uh at, at my place my my bar i've got those just sort of on the side that i bust out for a special occasion so it's um yeah, if you guys are looking for other you know inter international ones to try then yeah i can definitely recommend those but that that balvini uh, 14 was was quite delicious and the guy at, at um at dan murphy's he was a whiskey drinker himself and he he said the, that he actually preferred that one to the 18 i haven't tried the 18 myself but yeah i can say the 14 is uh is delicious yeah so we we love glengoyne cherry clask as well um we're quite often drinking the glengoyne 18 um which is yeah, a, a delicious, reasonably, I can't believe it's, you know, what price it is for an 18 year old delicious sherry cask. But yeah, that's one of my favorites. And uh, you, you do have a little bar in, in distillery is uh, <laughs> um, the um, uh, in terms of visitors and uh, uh, tours and things. Uh, people have to make an appointment. 
Uh, what what's but, the process if somebody wants to like <laughs> traveling down Wollongong way they want to pop in? Uh, yeah, the bar is basically just for us. <laughs> um, he, he, said, he means the, the, the alcohol in the bar. Alcohol, wine bar. <laughs> so, um, we do have a, a tasting bar, but um, we have a lot of spirits on the back shelf, kind of like you, David, but um, they're, they're for our, our, just our private events. But uh, we, we, we do free tastings and tours every Friday from four till seven. Um, you can just pop in and... Um, have a yarn with us, taste our products. We don't charge anything. We just lo love sharing our story. And um, also on Sunday, 12 to 4, we do free tours and tastings as well. So no need to book. Um, we're only a small distillery, so you can just show up and sling some bull with one of the two owners. <laughs> I'd, I'd say, though, for not this coming weekend, but the weekend after, uh, we'll actually be at the Good Food and Wine Show. So, um, I mean, if you if you are planning to come to the distillery, always just sort of have a look on Google Maps, or even just sort of shoot us a text on on Facebook or Instagram, whatever, just to just to make sure um, yeah, that we'll definitely be here. I'd hate for anyone to you know drive here from Sydney or wherever and then um, see that it's it's one of the days that um, yeah we've been able, unable to close. But it's 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 rare, but um, yeah, not this coming weekend. The next one we'll be at the Good Food and Wine Show, so yeah, we'll be closed then. Excellent. Right. Well, uh, uh, let's uh, then end off with the the whiskeyless uh, bourbon cask. Um, that's at uh, fifty eight percent. We might. We should have probably um, drank the gin after this. <laughs> You're going to get a shock to your palate now. You guys might need a, a cracker or um, sniff your skin. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so this for us is uh, a lot of the Japanese and Irish whiskies are lighter in style. So uh, this one's light, much lighter. It's not cask forward. We haven't tried to cover up some off notes with a with you know a really strong sherry or a port finish. Uh, so this is purely showcasing the the new make. Um, the nice. It's really subtle. It's a we do a cold ferment on this, similar to a lager beer. So we're not forming heaps of cogeners. The fruity flavors that form are subtle and complex, uh, but it's also very smooth, even at high ABV. Because we've done that cold ferment and aged it for five years, uh, it hasn't got as much spice as, um, as you would expect. It, it's, especially if you add some water to it as well, you're going to get a really smooth finish for that high of ABV. I remember when uh, um, when a few of us came down to 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 again do some research and to to try a few casks. Um, it was pretty unanimous that this was the one that uh, uh, we would have uh, uh, or, or preferred. And um, mm. um, and and as you say, at that at that fifty eight percent, it's uh, it's surprisingly dangerously easy easy drinking at that. Yeah, so it's a very 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 different um, style than a lot of the other Australian distilleries are doing. So um, yeah, very light, light, fruity, a tiny bit of smoke, um, closer to a triple distilled Irish or a, a Japanese whiskey, which is lighter and mellower in flavor. So that's what we're going for with this one. Uh, yeah, a, a, a quite a different ferment process by doing the cold ferment, trying to um, not form those harsh cogeners in the fermentation and then uh, controlling the distillation cuts to make it, make it really nice, clean, smooth. Yeah, the uh, you, you said that you know, the bourbon cast does showcase the uh, the spirit, and it uh, mm. always use the example of uh, Warren Buffett who uses this analogy talking about the stock market, but it's uh, completely relevant to the whiskey industry. That uh, uh, it's only when the tide goes out do you realize who's been swimming without his shorts. <laughs> Is that uh, um, uh, mm. one way to uh, uh, to test the, uh, uh, the the quality of of, uh, of the spirit? Uh, is to to just put it in a bourbon cask and and just uh, produce it as it is. Have any of you tried uh, um, uh, tried adding a bit of water to it? And I'd say it's it's uh, certainly easy drinking as it is, but interested to see what what you think with a bit of water. Zach reckons it's uh, as if somebody's filled his his glass with. Uh, Vanilla ice cream, just melted vanilla ice cream. 
yeah, you'll definitely get the flavors of, of vanilla, um, kind of like toffee, uh, the oak from the, the bourbon cast. The, um, the, the fruits, they come from the ferment, that, that, that uh, apple, that, the toffee apple flavor, that's definitely from the ferment. Um, and, and yeah, light style, sessionable, and yeah, smooth, smooth and mellow. And uh, so this one, 700 mils at 58%. Uh, it's uh, just a uh, um, member special at, at 150. I think it's, it's excellent value. Um, so that goes on sale at uh, 8.30 tonight. You would have all received your, your emails. Um, you could have uh, you know, pre-ordered as well, but uh, that's, that's the kickoff for having it on sale. Um, how many bottles? And, uh, I can't remember how many bottles was uh, there. Yeah, let me just figure it out on my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 200. No, I hate yeah. to admit it, but we haven't bottled them quite. Not all yet. of them finished bottling. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, some of them we, uh, yeah, just been waiting for the labels to arrive. 200 and something. Yeah, we, we, we got the, uh, uh, say, hot off the press, just a, uh, a clean skin bottle. Um, they they all will all be ready once uh, uh, once all the orders been placed. But that's uh, uh, yeah. be ready. It, to it, yeah, two hundred. <laughs> yeah, two two hundred liters, seven hundred mils. Um, mm. Pretty much uh, you know, straight out of the cask. So um, yeah, so it's round about that. It's not not a lot, basically. Yeah, maybe three hundred, but um, yeah, high twos. Yeah, something like that. Right. Um, uh, any other questions for Jared and Dean and, and the guys? Yeah, Jared, can I ask? Um, your cold ferment, um, yeah. is, unless it's a trade secret, how, how cold are you fermenting? Like, so we like, go like, down to 16 degrees, pitch the yeast, and then allow it to, to free rise after the second day. So um, it's a little bit of a trade secret, but I don't know if you're just starting a distillery or not. Maybe I just gave that away. <laughs> no, just, just a home brewer, dude. Um, so, no, yeah. yeah it's, uh, so traditionally, a whiskey would be fermented, you know, between 24 and 28. And that's yeah. going to really accentuate the fruit flavor. But it's also going to create much more um, esters and other higher alcohols, which will not make it as smooth, which will need a longer time. Or fl those flavors you might want to they react with more oak and um, also, for instance, sherry or port flavors and become new flavors. When um, you're having a bourbon cask, which um, that was from a Four Roses, I think it was Four Roses bourbon, a lot of the oak's gone. So it's really um, a lot of the, the new make spirit coming through. Um, yeah, the, the not forming some of those really harsh flavors is, is quite important. So the lower fermentation temps, they don't form the as higher ethyl acetate and a lot of the other solvent notes. Um, so I think if you ferment around 25, the ethyl acetate's kind of like 30 part per million, which starts to get really noticeable. And if you're fermenting low, like a lager beer temp, that can be down 12 degrees or like lower than we do, but we're closer to that, then you can get kind of like 10, 12 PPM ethyl acetate on the initial. Um, fermentation and then that will drop off over the over the years but some of the other flavors they're not as volatile as the ethyl acetate um ethyl acetate's got a real solvent like flavor in higher concentrations um it evaporates out but um some some of the other solvent like notes they don't evaporate out of the cask as easily so the yeah the cold ferment is is quite an interesting technique yeah cool thank you it all going well i'll pop in and see you tomorrow afternoon <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'll be. It's my sister's wedding tomorrow, but Dean will be here. All right. I'll see Dean then. Right. Sounds good. Right. Uh, I can really recommend if you are getting out that way. You don't need an excuse. Um, it's a, a fantastic visit. The, the the level of technology is is amazing. Uh, the the enthusiasm of the guys is really infectious. Um, and and as, as you can tell from the whiskeys, uh, they're doing great stuff. You know, um, $130 for the 700 mil a pair and, and muscats, I think it is, somewhere around there. Um, fantastic. And uh, 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 if you are heading off to the Food and Wine Festival, uh, then you'll see them there as well. 
and try some of the other other products if you do go to that you better um you better not drive because <laughs> you know <laughs> there's gonna be like a hundred stalls to taste um i just wish i was the one doing the tasting <laughs> hopefully dean can take over for a few hours and i'll um i'll run around and taste you know 30 stalls and then i'll be back and i'll be extra jolly <laughs> well fantastic and thanks for joining us everybody and uh uh, remember at 8 30 all the uh, the bottles will be available for sale and uh, hope to see you at our next events and thanks for your time jared and dean and uh, thank you guys thanks everyone look forward for coming. to the, the the next uh uh releases coming out of the distillery thanks guys thanks heaps man <laughs>